Stanley Kubrick's The Shining has inspired many fans into making many different theories, with the help of the internet, no doubt. They range from alternative to fringe to just plain kooky. You may even see some on this channel. If you consider yourself a fan of the movie and have been trolling YouTube, and you are, you've likely heard of a particular theory out there that is both controversial yet pretty compelling. For once, some theories aren't mine. For those that are, the alternative theories mentioned within may cause anxiety, rage, and disbelief. But that's why you're here, I hope. Kindly consider leaving a like, share, or subscribe if you enjoy this content. It's as easy as opening a can of fruit cocktail. Now on to the video. <coughs> Let's dive straight into the theory from what I will refer to as the Ager video. Because this is YouTube, I'll be dancing around certain words to not upset our AI overlords. I'm guessing most of you will look past the safe words and know exactly what I'm talking about. Which states, Jack was physically and emotionally abusing Danny in a very, very bad way. It all comes to the surface when Wendy sees a grown man cosplaying in a bear costume, giving attention to a man sitting on the bed in front of him. Kubrick had left clues, visual, audio, and verbal, including subliminal and innuendo throughout the film. While it's implied incidents happened before the family moved into the Overlook, one occurred inside the caretaker's apartment. Everything we see inside room 237 never happened, but were separate dreams of Danny and Jack. This won't be a reaction video or a critique, but we will explore what is canon versus what is circumstantial. What definitively happened in the in-film universe versus something we are led to believe that may have happened. I'll discuss reasons why we would think one way or the other. Were we coerced? Or is this evidence solid and only the blind and foolish choose not to believe? The 300 pound bear in the room is just how random and out of place it was. Because this is Kubrick and something not from the source material, many needed to find meaning in it. The Shining is full of themes. Not every one of them needs to go very far or influence the plot very much. The references to Native American art and wardrobe, that's a theme. The Gold Room, that's a theme too. Mirrors and reflective objects, that's another that means more than the prior two. The Bear is a theme. We see it early with Danny's pillow. It's posted on the walls. Some theorize Ullman was part of the theme inspired by his wardrobe in a deleted scene. Even his tie is a teddy bear brown. Does that mean Jack was a very bad father? The counter-argument is this was not entirely a new invention of Kubrick. There is an appearance of a dog man in Stephen King's novel who shows some affinity to Horace Derwent. The well-dressed man on the bed could be an unspoken reference to him. There are other unspoken references to the source material that don't go anywhere, whether it's the boilers, the scrapbook, or references to Stovington, where Jack lost his teaching job. However, the Ager video dismisses Kubrick would make such a cosmetic change without a deeper purpose. Personally, a teddy bear is much more relatable than a teddy dog to me. There is a correlation between Danny's teddy and Roger the man in the bear suit, but does that constitute abuse? Does Tony ever tell you to do things? I don't want to talk about Tony anymore. When Danny succumbs to a vision, he wakes up with the doctor examining him. This is the first time we see a bear. We also get an explanation of who or what Tony is. It's also not a coincidence that it's in a bedroom. Although, isn't that what most general hotel rooms are? The bear is portrayed to be sinister by its cropped eyes. This is a reference to the elevators, which parallels a gaping mouth, which is mirrored by Danny's scream. Very early in the film, Danny is burdened by an ominous shadow. The conversation the doctor has with Danny can be interpreted one of several ways, depending if it was your first time watching or familiar with the book. Tony is Danny's alter ego, or his personification of his shining's power. If you are familiar with the novel, you'll see this was Kubrick's idea, how to describe Tony. 
With my first watch, I didn't think a talking finger worked. The truth is, we can have that, or we can have this. A floating ghost force Tony as depicted in the ABC miniseries. Sometimes less is more. If you're a proponent of the Jack had done things, terrible things theory, you'll hear a lot of innuendo. Danny wasn't talking about an invisible friend, but an unwelcome villain he's too familiar with. You'll also see it in his body language as he's being noticeably defensive. The cracks in the theory here is that it will be established that Danny does have clairvoyant powers. It will be associated with red rum and the spilling of blood. Tony may not be a sign of ideal mental health, but he is real. And how Danny places his hands, I think that's normal. Not just for a kid undergoing an examination, but for a child actor on the set under hot lights and everyone is looking. But there is room for middle ground with another theory. While Tony is the shining personified, could it be suggested that his powers emerged when the abuse started? We don't know how long Wendy thought Tony made his appearance in the Torrance household in the film, but it's suggested by King that Tony emerged when Danny had his first accident at the hands of Jack. While Seinwinder's best doctor can guess the timing of an invisible friend, he could not foresee Tony with supernatural powers. Kubrick was meticulous with the cinematography. He told his story through the camera as much as he did with dialogue. If Tony was a result of Jack's misdeeds, how else would Kubrick associate one with the other? The Ager video gives light how Tony is introduced. The camera peers through a doorway with Danny bending over to our right, partially obfuscated. This is exactly how the man in the bear suit is introduced. Both Danny and the Bear Man are not alone, and both are playing with an appendage. Other theories about this scene, I don't see panning out. I see Danny washing his hands, not brushing his teeth, with a mouth full of frothy toothpaste. You can choose to either link these two cuts, else it's a very consistent way how Kubrick teases the audience with suspense. Since we've discussed some foreshadows that casted hints of a troubling life Danny lives, let's cut to where and when the theory states the abuse happened. The theory's clues point to inside the caretaker's apartment when Danny walked up to Jack. After a very obtuse conversation between a father and his son, the scene cuts to black with a disturbing musical cue. The Ager video posits that this cue signals something terrible happened as soon as it cut to black. That everything we saw in the room is setting up to something we did not. Applying this clue to this conclusion is highly subjective. In music theory, this can be described as resolution or dissonance. If you believe the tension building during this scene is immediately resolved through Jack's very bad actions, then you heard a resolution. However, if you think the tension is still building beyond, then what you heard is dissonance. Yet, there is another clue that is more interesting, tying the bedroom with the bathroom of room 237. It lies in the mirror. Mirrors and reflections are a theme of its own, but this particular mirror is especially interesting as it boasts the same interior design as the bathroom of room 237. The mirrors projected an image of Jack's alter ego, or his darker side. We see in his reflection, Jack gesturing to Danny in a slow, methodical manner, similar to the young woman of the bathtub. But that's not what makes it curious. It's the mirror's cloud bubble design that matches the pattern on the floor before the tub. This is easy to overlook. Does this mean there is a symbolic link between the caretaker's bedroom and 237's bathroom? So, what of room 237 that follows? The Ager video states that Danny's point of view of room 237 is a nightmare before he approaches Wendy with his injuries and sucking on his thumb. Danny has regurgitated or reassembled his experiences by blaming an imaginary old crazy woman who lives in room 237. Jack, knowing it's not true, sleeps off his drunken state 
and has his own nightmare influenced by Danny's story as told by Wendy. His guilt manifests itself as the old crone. Jack returns to Wendy, telling her he saw nothing, because he never bothered to step inside. And this sort of explains how he acted so casual and forgetful of his traumatic experience just minutes earlier. Jack's equally crazy theory that Danny hurt himself is soon dropped and forgotten when he gets in an argument and retreats to his favorite bartender. Alright, I'm not a believer in these sets of clothes. First off, on a Monday, Danny asks his mother if he can get his toy from the apartment. He walks in, has his talk with Jack, we get the musical cue, and we flash forward to Wednesday. It was on that Wednesday he showed up battered and bruised in front of Wendy and Jack. Now we're left to think he either walked around for two days all banged up and no one noticed, or we are back to a theory that Danny had his nightmare two days later and he applied the injuries to himself. This alternative theory goes above and beyond the Agra video. Another counter argument is purely subjective. Is the importance or lack of importance of Room 237. Even if you never read the King novel, Kubrick sets up the dangers of Room 237 early. It's a place even Halloran is frightened of. If you believe no one bothered walking inside 237, then the lore of the room is just an inspiration, a seed of an idea, for Danny to give a random room number to Wendy. But remember, Danny read the number from Halloran's mind. No one put the idea in his head. He stole it from Dick. What about Jack's visit? Did he step inside or did he just sleep it off? I'm going to get to that after I share my alternative theory. If Danny experienced bad acting from the hands of Jack, that would have to happen on Wednesday. We see Danny stroll into room 237 after playing with his toys. Its door unlocked and open waiting for him to step inside. How was he lured? By a tennis ball that mysteriously rolls up to him. When was the last time we saw a tennis ball? In the hands of Jack. Is this Jack's tennis ball? With this alternative theory, we don't need to consider it was a dream of Danny's. It's more akin to King's vision of Danny walking inside on his own volition. The growing tension happening on Monday still works, as does the subtle message how Danny was victimized when he shows up in front of Wendy. Danny's reimagining of his abuser as an old woman applies as well. Now we come to whether or not Jack bothered to investigate room 237. If you don't believe in the theory, the story behind Room 237 is similar to King's lore behind Room 217. The hotel room had a history of a woman who self-sacrificed, is terribly powerful with The Shining. Danny goes inside, meets a walking corpse of the woman, and gets roughed up, but not in that way. This gets back to Jack and Wendy. Jack goes inside the hotel room, sees very suspicious activity, then returns to Wendy acting as if nothing happened. Fans of Kubrick may want to find embellished meaning behind Jack's convenient amnesia. However, it's not original, as you'll discover the same absence of memories in King's work too. It's awfully curious how both depictions are very similar. If you do believe in the theory, then it doesn't matter too much whether you think Jack slept it off or not. He knew what room 237 looked like, and he was already inside. He was overcome by guilt in his sleep, and we see how Jack isn't right when he falls asleep. He suffers from hallucinations that grow in intensity each time he dips into the unconscious world. Personally, there isn't enough evidence he took another nap between the time Wendy woke him from a stupor and when he returned to the apartment. If he was responsible, I see him going through the motions, walking through the room, before his guilt hit him hard. His lustful desires, Jack's point of view, morphed into Danny's fright, Danny's point of view, and Jack runs out, hoping to lock his past behind him. 
Not by the hair on your chinny chin chin. How do we buy ourselves into this theory? Innuendo, subliminal clues, and musical notes aren't enough. We have to be convinced Jack Torrance is a type of character able and despicable enough to do it. We're going to get one commonly held belief out of the way. That's the one crediting Jack Nicholson's performance as a man who always seemed a step outside Crazy World. Much to the chagrin of the author of the source material. Does his performance alone have us forgive other lore? Though we shouldn't look to the source material to answer questions from Kubrick's film, we can see where ideas originated from. We also learn how they are expressed differently from the same inspiration, practically the same given exposition. For example, did you believe with Kubrick, Jack was a chronic abuser? Like with King as depicted in the ABC miniseries, there was only one time Jack yanked on Danny's arm when his papers were messed with. There is no other overt example mentioned aside from Danny's innuendo. Wendy mentions it once to the doctor. Jack talks about it again to the ghostly bartender. That might as well be an exposition to the audience. The miniseries, I would argue, goes deeper into this one example. Unlike Kubrick's Wendy, who makes an attempt to find good in the incident, yeah, he hasn't had any alcohol in uh, five months. The doctor doesn't buy it. King's Wendy gets emotional, telling the story to the sidewinder doctor. While Kubrick talks about it, King revisits the past in flashbacks. Kubrick gives passing references of something that happened, once. It's up to us to believe how much characters are still influenced by it. The miniseries, however, isn't very subtle at all. It may have happened once, but the memory still encumbered Jack and Wendy. Ironically, the closest Kubrick showed Jack being a threat to Danny before he picked up the axe was during his talk when he promised he would not. While King had Jack showed hints of physical instability early, I would say he got closer to Danny with the mallet. Yet, I think most of us would choose Jack Nicholson as the one more insane and dangerous. Likewise, no one thinks of Steven Weber as an abusive father, even after the miniseries invests time in lengthy exposition. The family's harmony is blemished, but... Well, things are, uh, okay. This takes us to Jack's drinking problem. How many of you assume with Kubrick Jack was an alcoholic? Funny, it's never said. We never gave Jack the benefit of the doubt. We just presumed it. Wendy tells a story. Just one of those things, you know, purely an accident. Jack makes a quip. We don't drink. Well, then you're in luck. And Jack later gives dialogue at the bar that somehow compacts his efforts or struggles to stay sober in a couple sentences. Here's to five miserable months on the wagon. But we never see him inebriated, do we? The miniseries is long-winded with Jack's struggle. It's beaten like a dead horse. He has his sessions. He's tempted. He succumbs. Jack talks about drinking. Wendy thinks about his drinking. Even Danny shares an opinion or two. Unlike Kubrick, there is no question Jack gets drunk. How did Kubrick manage to get the point across so effortlessly that the miniseries spent four hours telling us? Now, I'm not making an argument, although I could, about the differences between one drunken incident and a chronic problem with drinking. I am raising awareness of how we're easily persuaded by tropes. We hear a story about someone who had too much to drink, experienced one unfortunate event, then makes a vow to go dry. Out of convenience, we assume he is forever burdened with temptations and must avoid them, else there will be consequences. We don't need to be told Jack has a problem, which in turn means he may have other problems. He is the problem. Our cynicism, our prejudgments, are fueled when we witness how Jack treats Wendy, 
something the miniseries wouldn't dare approach. Has he ever hit you, Mrs. Torrance? Oh, God, no. Never. Just fine. Dick, can we borrow Mrs. Torrance for a few minutes? We're on our way through to the basement. I promise we won't keep We've her We've discussed long. tropes, innuendo, and subliminal messages by costume or set design that point to a conclusion that Jack is more of a terrible person than what he first seemed. One clue discussed in the Ager video are the mature adult posters placed in the boiler room. They're a little risque, but a clue linking Danny's ordeal? Those decorations could mean nothing more than something you'll see in Alien or even Die Hard. But, presenting them in front of Wendy is the theme of a misogynist attitude spiked in the film. The hotel hired Jack, but Ullman decides to delegate this work to someone else, not under contract. Good morning, Jack. Hope you haven't been waiting too long. No problem. In fact, we had time to grab a bite to eat. Go I have left out the most damning of evidence. That would be Jack's choice of magazine to read at the Overlook lobby. Thanks to a high-definition pause, we clearly see the type of magazine, one for more mature audiences, and more popular with women with a more uncomfortable topic. Out of the things we see in The Shining, this is more eyebrow raising than a grown man who spends the afterlife in costume as a bear. To say this changes everything is an understatement. I've heard the counter argument that the magazine was just something picked up on the set, that it wasn't supposed to mean anything because no one could have predicted digitized media with followers loving to pause and scan. If true, the production crew had more problems than they let on. It's too much of a coincidence to have the magazine face up with a particular article title on its cover. Do I believe the magazine was left for guests in the in-film universe? No. It's more likely an easter egg, a subliminal message, a hint, like the disappearing chair, the television with no power cord and no antenna, or the Torrance's beetle with a silent engine. It's a wink between Kubrick and the audience. A hint that we can see things the characters within their universe cannot. So, do I feel the Danny abuse subplot is bonafide, genuine, and canon? Even in the light of the evidence, many of which were a deliberate insert, I do not. Are there clues there? Is there a theme? Yes, absolutely. The bear symbols, the magazine, the design of bathrooms and mirrors linking one room with another can't be overlooked. But there is enough doubt that it is nothing more than a theme. There are other themes about Native American history, mazes, and lucid dreams. Some are little more than clever references that only a conspiratorial mind takes deeper. If you're looking at the innuendos as proof, it could be clever doublespeak, or just coincidental. There's a video you can easily find on YouTube reviewing the ABC miniseries and their double entendres. It's taken as comedy rather than the very dark subject matter. I want to see just how much you got. If, for no other selfish reason, this was not a story I wanted to be told coexisting with another about the Overlook Hotel and The Shining. Jack was destructive enough being an emotional abuser on top of his inability to write and produce for his family. We can see the Overlook, as Dick Halloran warned, a place that shines and carries over the bad, evil things that happened. The hotel had its antagonists that pushed or encouraged Jack to insanity, even if those ghosts were entirely inside his head. But that's another video. Stanley Kubrick was extremely creative in ways of intertwining stories and ideas into his films. It is up to us to notice, decipher, and choose how tightly we embrace them. Let me know in the comments below, are you a believer in this Danny theory? I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider leaving a like. If you didn't, thanks for sticking around to the end. This is Mr. G of Synergy saying, it's better to wake up to breakfast than fall asleep in the cold. Check out other videos on the channel. Thanks for watching.